Laparoscopic Hartman's Reversal After Emergent Laparoscopic Hartman's Procedure. Tips for Dealing with a Difficult Rectal Stump. The use of minimally invasive surgery for emergent and elective conditions continues to expand and evolve. Multiple studies have documented the feasibility of a laparoscopic Hartman's procedure for complicated diverticulitis that is not amenable to an anastomosis with proximal diversion. Others have also shown the laparoscopic approach to Hartman's reversal, while challenging, is feasible and associated with better outcomes than the open approach. In theory, a Hartman's procedure performed laparoscopically should make the subsequent reversal more technically feasible. Our case is that of a 49-year-old female with no past medical history who initially presented to our emergency department with Hentry 3 diverticulitis. She underwent an emergent laparoscopic heart procedure. Of note, the perforation was in the proximal sigmoid with a significant amount of normal and uninvolved distal colon and rectum. The decision was made to leave a portion of the sigmoid in place in the hopes of facilitating an easier laparoscopic reversal. Six months postoperatively, she underwent a colonoscopy and flexible proctoscopy, which was significant for a long rectal stump of approximately 20 centimeters, and this, of course, included some sigmoid colon. In this video, we present our approach to the laparoscopic colostomy reversal, which illustrates that despite an initial laparoscopic approach, the rectal dissection can still be quite challenging. We use a four-port technique, a Hassan and a 12 for the stapler. This just illustrates our initial laparoscopic procedure, which was the Hartman's, showing Hinchy 3 diverticulitis. As you can see here, there's purulence in the pelvis extending into the cul-de-sac. Here you see the perforation, which again is in the proximal sigmoid colon. And what you'll note is that the mesentery is quite thickened in this area, and this is one reason why we felt trying to do an anastomosis in this setting would not be ideal. Here we've divided, and you see we have some sigmoid colon still left, uh, but it's relatively soft and compliant. Moving forward to our operation uh, for the reversal, here you see the appendix is actually tethered to the uh, nexa, but in general, there were few adhesions in the pelvis itself. We're just exploring here, you see the remnant sigmoid colon. We begin our dissection uh, at the cul-de-sac in filmy adhesions, and we prefer at this point to use uh, a Metzenbaum scissors without an energy source. Uh, we're initially surprised here in the amount of inflammation that's in the cul-de-sac as uh, we did a good irrigation at the first operation. Oftentimes this is where uh, a stapler will get hung up and so it is critical to uh, mobilize this area. Once we've mobilized the cul-de-sac a bit, we uh, turn our attention to the remnant sigmoid colon and this is actually sigmoid colon mesentery here. This is not mesorectal fat. As you can see, there's still a fair amount of inflammation despite the fact that we waited six months. Since we know we left sigmoid colon, and it's important to remember that we have to do a redivision onto the rectum to facilitate a colorectal anastomosis, especially for diverticular disease. We will often switch to the bipolar sealing device seen here. Uh, we think it does a good job of doing this dissection as the tissues can be thick and well, very well vascularized. We do try to preserve the superior rectal artery in these cases. While posteriorly, uh, the rectum and, and colon appear to be quite supple, Anteriorly is where we're having some issues and some concerns because anteriorly uh, there's a fair amount of thickening and as you can see here uh, there's inflammation and the bowel just doesn't look healthy in this area. What's more is we haven't actually truly identified circumferentially the, the bowel wall here. It's important to circumferentially dissect the rectum uh, prior to passing a stapler or attempting an anastomosis because there can often be angulations that uh, you're not aware of and it can look straight but because of angulations distally you can actually have a fair amount of length left on the rectum that you're not aware of. This is a good example of how uh, it's unclear where the uh, rectal wall is, but this is likely just thickened peritoneum here. And as we've seen this before, uh, we're quite comfortable doing this dissection. 
what you'll note is that thickened peritoneum at the cul-de-sac often creates a very tight angulation that prevents us from actually putting the stapler up and can even induce an injury if you're not careful. Here you can see we're going through the peritoneum. There's no bowel wall there. And this perirectal fat needs to be cleaned again to straighten the rectum to allow you to see where the rectal wall is and get the stapler up. What's more, we're not happy with the proximal rectum in this area, which is why we continue to go down. We will often place the smallest dilator up, and in doing so, you see here that uh, the rectum is strictured in this area. Um, we do this to facilitate a uh, easy placement of the stapler and to ensure that where we're going to divide is in a healthy area that we can get the stapler up. While this looks like it's right at the uh, peritoneal reflections, we do actually have a little length. After dividing, we mobilize the splenic flexure. Here we're just taking the momentum off of the transverse colon. We do mobilize the flexure in these cases. Here this is just a shot of us taking down the colostomy. We will mobilize the uh, descending colon, place the anibal, and then do our anastomosis intracorporeally. Here you see our stapler comes up very nicely. We've actually airily tested the stump prior to doing this to ensure that there was no occult injury. And you can see the stapler very well here. Uh, it is all the way at the end of the staple line. There is no twists or angulations. Here's our air leak test. We had two robust donuts. There was no air leak. And we actually did a flexible proctoscopy here. And you can see an intact anastomosis without tension. Our operative time was approximately 297 minutes. Her postoperative course was uneventful. She had resumption of bowel function on postoperative day two and was discharged to home on postoperative day three. Here you see the pre-op photo in the operating room after the first operation. And this is a six-week post-op uh, view of her abdomen. While the minimal invasive approach to colostomy reversals are feasible, significant challenges remain. In our series of approximately 10 patients, all required dissection and division of the rectum to facilitate a safe anastomosis. An initial laparoscopic approach for Hartman's procedure has the advantage of limiting significant small bowel adhesions. However, dissection of the rectal stump can still be challenging. Our video illustrates the difficulties encountered during laparoscopic Hartman's reversal and offers strategic tips to ensure success with a difficult procedure. Future studies may want to focus on factors to help predict a difficult rectal stump, thereby making the minimally invasive approach to colostomy reversal safer and more accessible. Thank you.